Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes. You're out at the old ball game. Today we start with uh, chapter four which is about motion in two and three dimensions. In chapter two, we defined position, velocity, and acceleration, the three quantities that we use to describe the motion. We describe them for motion along a straight line or one-dimensional motion. <clears throat> in this chapter, we will redefine these quantities as they apply to motion in two and three dimensions using the language of vectors that we studied in the previous chapter. So let's do that. Let's define the position, velocity, and acceleration. This is our subject for today. Lay down the <coughs> necessary mathematics and equations. And then in the uh, coming two lectures on chapter four, uh, we will have applications of these. First, we will apply them to uh, projectile motion, then we will apply them to circular motion, and then we will apply them to relative motion. So let's go through the equations for motion in two and three dimensions. And like I said in here, we will start with the position, then we will move to the uh, velocity, then the acceleration, and define them in a way that is similar to what we did back in chapter two for motion in one dimension. Let's start with the position. The position of a particle in two and three dimensional motion is represented by the vector r, and instead of x now we talk about r, and it is a vector that goes from the <coughs> from the origin of the coordinates to the point where the particle is. It goes that way, from the origin to the particle. And it is a vector, so it has x, y, and z components. And the x, y, and z components of the position vector are nothing but the coordinates of the particle. So we write the position vector r as equal to x, i, plus y, j, plus z, k. Okay, this is the position vector of the particle. It's a vector described as there that goes from the origin to the particle and whose components are the coordinates of the particle. As the particle moves from some initial position R1 to a new position R2, it will undergo a displacement delta R which is equal to the displacement of the particle, delta r, <coughs> is equal to r2 minus r1. And you can see that here, if you apply the head tail method, r1 plus delta r is equal to r2. That's exactly what we are saying in here. What are the components of this vector? Well, you can write it as delta x i plus delta y j plus delta z k, where delta x is x2 minus x1, delta y is y2 minus y1, and delta z is z2 minus z1. The curve, like this brown curve in here, the curve along which the particle moves is called the path of the particle or the trajectory, path or trajectory of the particle. With that, we are now ready to define the velocity of the particle. And we will define the velocity in a way similar to what we did in chapter two. First, the average velocity, and then 
the instantaneous velocity. Well, the average velocity of the particle is defined as V average. In chapter 2, we said delta X by delta T. Now we replace X by R, and this will be delta R by delta T. That's the average velocity of the particle. The instantaneous velocity, which is the velocity of the particle at any instant, V, is equal to dr by dt, okay? And instead of dx by dt, it is dr by dt. What is the value of this derivative? We'll go to this equation and take its derivative with respect to time. Remember that i, j, and k are unit vectors that are constant in time. So you only differentiate these. And that will be <coughs> dx by dt i plus dy by dt j plus dz by dt k. This one here is called the x component of the velocity. This is the y component of the velocity. And this is the z component of the velocity. The speed is defined as the magnitude of the velocity. So v is the magnitude of the velocity, which is equal to vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared under the square root. Another important point regarding the velocity is that at any instant of time, the velocity vector is tangent to the path of the particle. Remember that this is the path, the curve that is followed by the particle, the path of the particle. At any instant of time, the velocity vector is tangent to the curve at that point, at that instant of time. So it will go tangent to the curve. Here it will be this way. At this point, it will be that way. And here it will be this way, and so on. It is tangent to the path at that instant of time. The last vector <coughs> we want to deal with is the acceleration. And again, we will define it similar to the one-dimensional acceleration in the following way. The average acceleration <coughs> of the particle The average acceleration is defined as delta V by delta T, which is V2 minus V1. Remember, these are vectors divided by T2 minus T1. The instantaneous acceleration is equal to dV by dT. So you take the derivative of this equation, and that will be <coughs> d vx by dt plus uh, dvx by dt i plus dvy by dt j plus dvz by dt k. This one here is the x component of acceleration. This is the y component of acceleration. And this is the z component of acceleration. And in this way, we completed the equations that we need to describe motion in one, <coughs> uh, sorry, in two and three dimensions. Just one last point to complete the analogy with uh, chapter two, and that is motion with constant acceleration. <coughs> in one dimension, we have seen the three kinematic equations of motion. <coughs> the first one says V is equal to V0 or V initial plus AT. The second one says X is X0 plus V0 uh, T plus one half A T squared. And the third one says uh, V squared is V0 squared plus 2A X minus X0. How do these equations look like in two and three dimensions. If we have a particle 
that moves in two and three dimensions with constant acceleration. How do we translate these equations? Well, you just take the vector, uh, the vector form of these equations. The first one here will look like v as a vector now is equal to v0 as a vector plus a vector multiplied by t. The second one, do you replace x with r? So it will be r is equal to r0 vector plus v0 vector t plus one half a vector t squared. And the third one is a little bit uh, tricky to see. It will be v squared is equal to v0 squared plus 2a dot. Here you use the dot product. 2a dot r minus r0. And what is v squared? It is v dot v. And v0 squared is v0 dotted with v0. And this way, we completed all the equations that we need to, uh, to have to deal with all the uh, situations. The acceleration can be in any direction. It's not like the velocity. The velocity is always tangent to the curve. The acceleration can be in any direction because as we will see in chapter five, the acceleration follows the direction of the force that is acting on the particle. <coughs> <coughs> Now let us consider uh, let us consider uh, examples on motion in two and two or three dimensions. And the example uh, we will consider is that of a rabbit. Okay, we will consider a rabbit. In the first example, we will find its position. <coughs> in the second example, we will find its velocity. In the third example, we will find its acceleration, but it is the same motion. So let's look at the first one here. The example says, a rabbit runs across a parking lot on which a set of coordinate axes has been drawn. So we have a parking lot with these lines drawn on the ground, and we release this rabbit. We find that it is running in two dimensions on this parking lot, and we are, let's say, videotaping or watching the motion from the top. We watch it for some time, uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes, and then take uh, the camera, analyze the motion, and we find that as the particle, as the rabbit moves, its x-coordinate, the x-coordinate of its motion varies with time according to this equation here, and its y-coordinate varies with time according to this equation here. Now, both equations are quadratic, so, the x motion is motion with constant acceleration, and the y motion is motion with constant acceleration. The problem says, at this instant of time, at t equal to 15 seconds, what is the rabbit position vector? Where is the, the rabbit? The rabbit's position vector r. Write it in unit vector notation and in magnitude angle notation. So, <clears throat> we will go to these equations. Substitute t equal to 15 and find the position of the rabbit. <clears throat> x is equal to, let me write down the equation, minus 0.31 t squared plus 7.2 t plus 28 and the y coordinate of the rabbit is 0.22 t squared plus <coughs> minus 9.1 t plus 30. 
Now, what are the values of these at t equal to 15 seconds? The x coordinate at that instant, you just substitute t equal to 15, so it will be minus 0.31 times 15 squared, 225, plus 7.2 times 15, plus 28. If you put all the numbers, you will find that this is equal to 66.25 meters. Likewise, we find the y coordinate, substitute t equal to 15 here, that will be 0 0.22 times 225 minus 9.1 times 15 plus 30. And that will be equal to minus 57 meters. So we write the position vector of the rabbit xi plus yj. It will be 66.25i minus 57j in meters. Where is the rabbit? Positive x, negative y. The rabbit is in the fourth quadrant at that instant of time. So here is the position of the rabbit in unit vector notation, and you can see that here, at that instant of time, this is the position vector in the fourth quadrant uh, of the coordinate system. Now let us write this in magnitude angle notation. What is the magnitude of this vector? Well, the magnitude is x squared plus y squared under the square root, which will be 66.25 squared plus 57 squared under the square root, and that will be equal to 87.4 meters. What is this number here? This number is the distance of the rabbit from the origin at that instant of time. It is the length of this line. So it is the distance of the rabbit from the origin at that instant of time. What is the angle it makes? Well, just like we did in chapter three, sketch the vector. Here is the vector r. It's in the fourth quadrant. So we first find this angle phi, the angle the vector makes with the x-axis in that quadrant. How much are these numbers here? This is the y coordinate, which is the 57. And this is the x coordinate, which is 66.25. So phi is equal to tangent inverse of 57 divided by 66.25, and this is equal to 40.7 degrees. So what is the angle theta that it makes with the positive x-axis? Theta is equal to 360 minus phi, and that will be equal to 319.3 degrees. And in this way, we have completely specified the position of the rabbit. The second part of the problem says, graph, draw the rabbit's path for t equal to zero to t equal to 25 seconds. So what you have to do here is repeat what we did here, okay, for all instants of time, t equal to zero, one, two, three, four, five, until you reach t equal to 25 seconds, okay? It's a lengthy process. You can definitely make use of a computer. A program like Excel will aid you in uh, finding out these very quickly. So you will get something like this, okay? This is the, the position vector at t equal to zero, t equal to five, just like that one. t equal to 10, 15, 20, 25. The path is the curve that connects the tips, the heads, of these arrows, and that's the path taken by uh, the uh, rabbit, or you can draw this, the path of uh, uh, the, the trajectory of this equation in two dimensions, and you will get that curve in there. So this is the first example in which we discussed the position of the rabbit. Now let's move to the next example, which says, find the rabbit, uh, for the rabbit of the previous problem, 
find the velocity at that instant of time. We did here the position at time t equal to 15. Now we want to do the same thing, but for the velocity. What is the velocity of the rabbit at t equal to 15 seconds? <coughs> so let me keep, keep the position here because I will use it to find the velocity. The first thing we have to do here is to find the equations of the velocity. <coughs> for the, <coughs> the position, the equations are already there, but for the velocity you have to drive the equations. The x component of uh, the velocity is the derivative of the x coordinate with respect to time. So take the derivative of this. This will be minus 2 times that, 0.62t, and the derivative of this is plus 7.2. The y component of the velocity is the derivative of the y coordinate. Take the derivative of this, 2 times that is 0.44t minus 9.1. These are the equations for the uh, components of the velocity as functions of time. Now let us find how much are these at time t equal to 15. At t equal to 15 seconds, these components will have the following values. <coughs> What are they? V x is equal to minus 0 0.62 times 15 plus 7.2, and that will be uh, equal to minus 2.1. Okay, minus 2.1 meters per second. The y component <coughs> is equal to Substitute here, 0.44 times 15 minus 9.1. And if you put the numbers, you will find that this is minus 2.5 meters per second. So the velocity in unit vector notation is equal to the x component, Vxi, plus the y component, j, which will be minus 2.1i, minus 2.5 j in meters per second. The speed is the magnitude of the velocity, which will be equal to 2.1 squared plus 2.5 squared under the square root, and that will be equal to 3.3 meters per second. So this is the unit vector notation. This is the magnitude, the speed, and it will be if you redo the uh, angle like we did with the uh, position, you will find that this is a vector. Of course, it's a vector in the third quadrant. Okay, as you can see in here, that's the velocity. It points toward the third quadrant, making an angle of 230 degrees with a positive x direction. And this shows you how completely different are these vectors? We found that the position of the rabbit is in the fourth quadrant. This is R, okay? This is the previous example. The position is in the fourth quadrant, but the velocity is toward the third quadrant. Two totally different vectors, okay? Here is an example. Let's say that we have a person who wants to go from Jeddah to Tabuk. And we take the capital real as our origin uh, of coordinates. So here is the origin. Where is the person? The person is here. His position vector is this one, the vector that connects it to the origin. So we say that the person is in the third quadrant, but he is moving in the direction of the second quadrant. This is where the velocity is. This is where he is moving. Is moving that way, so that's the direction of the velocity which is in the second quadrant. Let's go back to the rabbit and continue our discussion uh, of that example. Now we are in example three, 
in which we want to <coughs> find the acceleration of the rabbit. So sample problem 403 says for the rabbit of the previous problems, what is the acceleration A at time t equal to 15 seconds? Well, the acceleration, as we have discussed, is equal to the derivative of the velocity. A is equal to dv by dt, which is dvx by dt i plus dvy by dt j. So go to these equations. This is vx. Take its derivative with respect to time. What will that be? That's the time. I have minus 0.62. Minus 0.62i. And then go to the equation for the y component. Take its derivative with respect to time. There I have the time. So this will be plus 0.44j in meters per second squared. And as you can see, this is constant in time. For whatever time, 15 or any other time, the acceleration is constant. And we realized that from the beginning because the equations for the position are quadratic. So we concluded right from the beginning that this is motion with constant acceleration as we have it in here. Now, if you like, you can uh, continue, find the magnitude of the acceleration. This is unit vector notation. The magnitude of the acceleration is 0.62 squared plus 0.44 squared under the square root, and that will be 0.76 meters per second square. And it makes an angle of, where is this? This is negative x, positive y, so it is in the second quadrant. As you can see in here, that's the, uh, the acceleration. It's a vector in the second quadrant. And the angle it makes with the positive x-axis is 144.6 degrees. You find it like we found the, uh, the angle for the position vector. <clears throat> okay, now let's see some more uh, problems, and we will now consider this very nice checkpoint from the textbook. Very nice, very illustrative, very conceptual. The problem says, or the checkpoint says, the figure shows a circular path. We have a particle that is moving along a circle or around a circle, a circular path taken by a particle. If the instantaneous velocity of the particle is 2i minus 2j, the particle is rotating, okay? At one instant of time, its velocity is given by this 2i minus 2j. Before we move on, if you have a vector, and at one instant of time, the two components of the vector are equal, like in here, 2 and 2, then the angle made by that vector is 45 degrees in that quadrant. This vector here is where? It's positive x, negative y, so it's a vector in the fourth quadrant, but it makes an angle of 45 degrees in that quadrant. So let's get back to the problem. It says, if the instantaneous velocity of the particle is 2i minus 2j, through which quadrant? Where is the particle? Through which quadrant is the particle moving at that instant if it is traveling clockwise or counterclockwise around the circuit? So let's analyze this situation. Let's start. This is the vector we are looking for. Let's start with the situation where the particle is going counter, counter, clockwise, okay? Counter, clockwise. Here is the circle, and we want to find in which quadrant will the particle be for it to have that velocity. So we draw the 45 degrees angles and draw tangents. Remember that the velocity is tangent to the path. The path in this case is the circle. So at each one of these four points, the velocity will be tangent to the circle in the direction of motion. The particle is going counterclockwise. So the velocity will look like that. It is tangent to the circle in the direction of the motion. 
counterclockwise like we see in here. Now, out of these four, where do we have this situation? We have it here, okay? So if the particle is going counterclockwise, it will have that velocity when it is in the third quadrant, okay? When it is in the third quadrant. Okay, what if the particle, uh, again, the velocity is in the fourth quadrant, but the particle is in the third quadrant. What if the particle is going clockwise? We, we do the same thing. Here is the circle. Here are the 45 degree lines. Draw tangents to the circle at these points in the direction of motion, clockwise. In this case, these are the directions of the velocity, okay? They go in the direction of motion, which is clockwise. Now, out of these four arrows, where do we have this one? We have it here. So if the particle is going clockwise, it will have that velocity when it is in the first quadrant. Again, watch the total independence of the two quantities. Let's now move into another example involving motion with constant acceleration. And this is sample problem 4-5 from the old edition of the textbook. Let's see what we have here. The problem says, a particle with initial velocity V0 equal to minus two I plus four J meters per second at tan t equal to zero, so that's the initial velocity, undergoes a constant acceleration. We are told that it's moving with constant acceleration of magnitude three meters per second squared at an angle of 30, uh, 130 degrees from the positive direction of the x-axis. What is the particle's velocity at t equal to five seconds? Well, this is motion with constant acceleration. So we have the three kinematic equations we need one of them here. What do we have? We have the initial velocity, we have the acceleration, we have the time. What do we need? We need the velocity. So the equation that we need in this problem is the one that says, this is from the old edition, the one that says V is equal to V0 plus AT. Okay, we have all of these. Let's find this one. V0 is given in unit vector notation. We just need to express A in unit vector notation. A is equal to, like, like any vector, it is AXI plus AYJ. And this is equal to A cosine of theta I plus A sine of theta J. Put the numbers. The magnitude of A is three. The angle it makes is 130 degrees. The angle made by the acceleration, I, plus three times sine of 130 degrees J. If we put the numbers, you will find that this is minus 1.9 I plus 2.3 J meters per second squared. So that is A. Now substitute. The velocity at time t equal to five seconds will be V0. V0 is minus two I, minus two I uh, plus four J plus the time, which is five seconds, multiplied by the acceleration, which is this, minus 1.9 I plus 2.3 J. So what is that? That is minus 2i plus 4j plus, let's multiply this, minus, and uh, this is equal to 9.5, 9.5i, okay, the product of uh, these two, plus, this will be 10, 11.5j, okay? And now add the i's, add the j's. So it will be minus two minus 
9.5i plus 4 plus 11.5j and that will be here it will be minus 11.5 minus 11.5i plus 15.5j in meters per seconds there is the velocity if you want to take one more step and find the speed of the particle the speed is the magnitude of the velocity so it is 11.5 squared plus 15.5 squared under the square root and this is equal to 19.3 meters per second this is a vector that is in <coughs> the second quadrant right negative x positive uh, y you can go ahead and find the angle of the velocity and if you do so you will find that it is 127 degrees measured from the positive x-axis counterclockwise we will conclude our discussion today by looking at a problem from the textbook and this is problem 16 about motion in two dimensions Okay. <coughs> Problem sixteen says the velocity v of a particle the velocity v of a particle moving in the xy plane is given by this equation so let's write the equation for the velocity this is problem 16 from the book the velocity of the particle is equal to 6t 6t minus 4 t squared i plus 8 j in meters per second okay 6t minus 4 t squared i plus 8 j this one here is the x component of the velocity and this is the y component of the velocity okay v is in meters per second and t is greater than zero t is always positive in seconds what is the acceleration at time t equal to 2.5 seconds well the acceleration a is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time where do we have the time here but there is no time there so take the derivative of this we will have 6 minus 8 t i it doesn't have a y component because that is constant. So how much is this at time t equal to 2.5 seconds? At t equal to 2.5 seconds, the acceleration is you just put 2.5 there, so it will be 6 minus 8 times 2.5 and all of this i. So if you uh, put the numbers, this will be minus 14 i in meters per second squared that's the acceleration at that instant of time when that means at what time when if ever is the acceleration zero well here is the equation for the acceleration when will it be zero it will be zero when this bracket is zero okay so let's find out the acceleration is zero when this thing is zero when six minus eight t is equal to zero so t is equal to six over eight or 0.75 seconds at that instant of time the acceleration will be zero part c when if ever 
is the velocity zero? The answer is the velocity will never be zero because the x component, as the time changes, the x component can be zero. But we will always have the y component equal to 8 meters per second. So the answer to C is never. The velocity will never be zero because the y component will always be there. So let's move to part D. Part D says, when, if ever, does the speed equal to 10 meters per second? We want to find the instant of time at which the speed of the particle is equal to 10 meters per second. We want to see if we will ever have that situation. So let's remind ourselves, what is the speed? The speed V is Vx squared plus Vy squared under the square root. Let's square both sides. V squared is equal to Vx squared plus Vy squared, which we can write as Vx squared is V squared minus Vy squared. Why did I write it this way? Because we know what is the speed. We want it to be 10 meters per second. Vy is always constant. So the only place where we have the time is in the x component. That's why we write it this way. So what is that equal to? V x squared. We want the speed to be 10 meters per second, so that is 100. Vy is 8 squared, 64, so that is 36. And therefore, take the square root of these two sides. We want Vx to be plus or minus 6. At what time will we have the situation? So now you have to be careful and analyze the situation case by case. Let's first take the positive sign here. If I take the positive sign, what is Vx? Vx is 6t minus 4t squared. We want it to be equal to 6. So let me take everything to that side and divide by 4. What do I have? This will, this will go there, positive, divide by 4, t squared. This will go there, negative, divide by 4, 1.5t, and divide this by 4, plus 1.5 is equal to 0. Quadratic equation, solve it for t. t is equal to 1.5, plus or minus, this is square, 2.25, minus 4 times 1, times 1.5, 6, under the square root, divided by 2. You can see that we will have a negative square root here, which will give us an imaginary uh, quantity, so we cannot have the positive sign here. That will not give us any solution. Let's next take the negative choice here. Negative. What do I have? 6t Vx, then it is 6t minus 4t squared. We want it now to be minus 6. So again, take everything to that side, divide by 4, we will have t squared. This will go there, negative. Divide by 4, 1.5t, and this will remain there. Divide by, one point, uh, by 4, so this will be 1.5 is 0. Solve this quadratic equation, t is 1.5 plus or minus 1.5 is the squared is 2.25 minus minus will be plus 4 times this is 6 under the square root divided by 2. Now we have a real uh, answer there and if we put the numbers this will be 1.5 plus or minus the square root of this quantity is 2.87 divided by 2. If I take the negative sign here, I will get negative time, which is incorrect. So I will take the only thing left is the positive sign. So it will be 1.5 plus 2.87 over 2. And that means the t at which the speed will be 10 meters per second is equal to 2.2 seconds. And there I have 
the requested time. With that, we come to the end of our class today in which we laid the mathematical background necessary to deal with the general motion in two and three dimensions. Okay, today we continue our discussion of uh, chapter 4. This is our second uh, lecture and we will start by reviewing the material that we discussed in the last lecture. Uh, we introduced motion in two and three dimensions. We discussed uh, position and displacement, velocity and speed, uh, uh, acceleration both average and instantaneous as they apply to motion in two and three dimensions. Specifically, we started by defining the position vector which locates the particle. It's a, a vector that goes from the origin to the particle and whose components are the coordinates of the particle. The velocity is always tangent to the path taken by the particle at any instant of time. It's a vector whose components are basically the time derivatives of the corresponding uh, uh, components of the position vector. The acceleration likewise is a three-dimensional uh, vector whose components are the time derivatives of the corresponding components of the velocity. Today we will consider a very important type of motion which is called projectile motion. Here we consider a special case of two-dimensional motion. So projectile motion takes place in two dimensions. A particle moves in a vertical plane. Now we have to distinguish very clearly what do we mean by vertical and horizontal planes. A vertical plane is a plane that is uh, perpendicular to the ground. So for example, this is here. A vertical plane. The ground is there and this plane is perpendicular to the ground so we call it a perpendicular plane. A plane that goes like this which is parallel to the ground is called a horizontal plane. So now we are talking about something that takes place in this plane, a plane that is perpendicular to the ground. So uh, a particle moves in a particle plane a vertical plane with some initial velocity v0 but its acceleration is always the free fall acceleration g which is downward so the particle is moving in the air in a two-dimensional uh, plane such a particle is called a projectile and its motion is called projectile motion an example of projectile motion is shown here for a tennis ball between impacts. So the ball will come, hit the ground, goes up, hit the ground, and goes up again and again. This kind of motion is the type of motion we are discussing in this uh, lecture, which is called projectile motion. Here are some other examples of projectile motion. In this example, we have a cannon that is firing a ball towards a ship. The ball, while being in the air, follows projectile motion, and this is the vertical plane that we talk about, and this is two-dimensional motion that has both X and Y components. In this example, we have a package that is released or thrown by a plane that flies horizontally, while in the air, the package will not fall vertically to the ground, but rather it will follow a projectile motion path which is as we will see parabolic path in this example in these two examples we have a ball that is kicked from the top of a building either at an angle or horizontally all of these examples are examples of projectile motion what is common to all of them 
is that the initial velocity, the initial velocity of the object has a horizontal component. If it only has a vertical component, then that is the free fall that we talked about in chapter two. Uh, whenever the initial velocity has a horizontal component, then that's where we have projectile motion. So our goal in this section is to analyze projectile motion using the equations for two-dimensional motion that we studied in the last lecture. To do that, we will assume the following. First, we will assume that air has no effect on the projectile. We will briefly, qualitatively look at the effect of the air at the end of our discussion. During its two-dimensional motion, the projectile's position vector r and velocity vector v it change continuously as it goes the position and the velocity will change continuously but its acceleration vector a is constant and always directed vertically downward because while it is in the air the only force acting on it is the force of gravity and the corresponding acceleration is the gravitational acceleration which is constant and downward the projectile has no horizontal acceleration. Here is the important point. In projectile motion, the horizontal motion and the vertical motion are independent of each other. They are not coupled together. They are independent. You can separate them. And if you can separate them, you can treat them individually, which makes it easier to deal with the projectile mathematically. So in projectile motion, the horizontal motion and the vertical motion are independent of each other and that means neither motion affects the other one. Let's look at examples of this portion because if we can uh, prove this point it will be a tremendous uh, mathematical simplification of the problem. So let's look at the first example here. What we have here is we have two boards, okay? A red board and a yellow ball. The red ball is simply released from rest and it falls vertically downward. The yellow ball is thrown horizontally. So for the yellow ball, the situation is like this. Here we have the ball and we just kick it. Okay, we give it a horizontal velocity so it will follow a projectile path. Now, the Red ball has only vertical motion in the y direction. The yellow ball has both components. It has a horizontal component and a vertical component. Let's forget about the horizontal component of the yellow ball. Let's just look at the vertical component. If you just consider the vertical components, you can see that the two balls are identical vertically because they are released from the same height at the same instant of time. And they are both released with zero initial vertical velocity. This one is released with zero initial velocity. This one is thrown horizontally. So at the moment of, of throwing, at the initial point, there is no vertical component of velocity of the yellow ball. So vertically it is identical to the uh, red, red ball. What we have here are stroboscopic photographs, uh, photograph pictures or photos, which are uh, images taken at certain instants of time. So every 0.1 of a second, an image is taken by this camera, by this special camera, and then they are all put together as a function of time. What we notice Let's say that this is 0 0.1 seconds, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Vertically, if you look at the vertical height of the two balls, you find them to be at the same height at every instant of time. What does that mean? Well, we expect that for the red ball. What, what about the yellow ball? The yellow ball, although it has a horizontal component of the velocity, that horizontal component did not affect the vertical motion of the ball. And vertically, it moves exactly like the red ball, which doesn't have a 
uh, horizontal component. So this is the point we want to prove. Although the yellow ball has horizontal and vertical components, the horizontal component did not affect the vertical component because the two motions are independent of each other. Let's take another example, but exactly the opposite. And that is this example here. A person, you can see that uh, moving picture there. What we have is a person who originally moves on a skate horizontally. At one point, he jumps up, but we know that he will come back on the skate as we can see in here. So, in this case, the two objects, the person and the skate, have the same horizontal motion. But the person, in addition to the horizontal motion, he has an extra vertical motion. But that vertical motion by the person did not affect his horizontal motion. And the evidence is that always, at any instant of time, he is always on top of the skate. His horizontal motion is not affected by the fact that he has an extra vertical motion. So again, we have total independence of uh, the two motions, and you can compare this to the previous case. Here, we said that the horizontal motion did not affect the vertical one. Here, we are saying that the vertical motion did not affect the horizontal motion. So, this feature, which feature? The independence of the two components, allows us to break a problem involving two-dimensional motion. We break it into two separate and easier one-dimensional problems. Now we can deal with the horizontal motion alone and the vertical motion alone. Each one of these two is one-dimensional motion, which we know very well from chapter two. So we have one for the horizontal motion, one problem for the horizontal motion, which is a very simple motion, motion with constant velocity. And the other problem is for the vertical motion, which is motion with constant downward acceleration. And that's basically the threefold that we studied back in chapter two. So here is how we will deal with the projectile problem. We will first consider the components of the initial velocity. Then we will consider the horizontal motion alone. Then we will talk about the vertical motion alone, and then we will couple them together. We will solve them simultaneously to come up with the equation of the path of the projectile. And finally, we will talk about a very important uh, property of uh, projectile motion, which is the horizontal range that is covered by the projectile. So let's deal now with the mathematics of this problem. And the situation we will consider is this one. It's a very specific situation. We have an object, this is the projectile, that is thrown with some initial velocity, V0, that makes an angle theta zero with the ground. Okay, so it is thrown from the ground. It will follow the projectile motion until it strikes the ground again. So this is the particular situation we will be considering here. So like we said, we will first look at the components of the initial velocity. Well, if we look at this particular situation we have here, you can write the initial velocity v0 as equal to just like any two-dimensional vector v0 x i plus v0 y j. And then you can find these two components from the figure. Here is the magnitude of the initial velocity. That's the angle it makes. So we can immediately write what these are. We have V0x is equal to V0 cosine of theta 0 
and V0y is equal to V0 sine of theta 0. So these are the components of the initial velocity. Now let us look at the horizontal component, the x component of the motion. So here is the analysis of the horizontal motion. The horizontal motion is a very simple one because it is motion with zero acceleration, with constant velocity. So in the horizontal motion, ax is equal to zero. And therefore, the velocity in the x direction is constant and it is equal to its initial value, which is this one here. So vx is equal to v zero cosine of theta zero. What about the horizontal distance travel? Well, x is equal to x zero. If we launch the object, if we take the launch point to be the origin, then x zero is zero. If we launch it from any other point, we take care of that by the location of the launch point. Plus v zero x, which is this one, v zero, cosine of theta zero multiplied by t. Basically, this is a very simple equation that says distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. And the speed in the x direction is that one. So that's basically what we are saying here. Next, we consider the vertical motion of the projectile motion. The vertical motion. And the vertical motion, like we said in the introduction, is motion with constant acceleration. This is basically the free fall that we studied in chapter two, okay? So we will basically write down the equations for free fall that we studied in chapter two. While the projectile is in the air, the only force acting with it is the force of gravity with corresponding acceleration that is equal to G. So in this case, the Y coordinate of the motion, Y, is equal to y0 plus, remember in chapter 2, we said y is equal to y0 plus v0t plus uh, minus one half gt squared. Only thing now is that this is v0y. We are talking about the initial velocity in the y direction, which is given by this equation here. That's the only change we do. So this is y0 plus v0 sine of theta 0t minus one half g t squared. And for the y component of the velocity, v y is equal to, remember, v is equal to v zero minus g t, except now we stress that by putting the label y there. v y is equal to v zero y, which is here, v zero sine of theta zero minus g t. The last equation is this one. v squared is v0 squared minus 2g y minus y0. We write it here, except that again, we put the label y there. So this will be v y squared is equal to v0 y, which is this one. So it will be v0 sine of theta 0 squared minus 2g y minus y0. And these are the equations that describe the vertical motion of the projectile. We note here, if we look at this figure, we note that the x component of the velocity is constant. At any point of its motion, the x component of the velocity does not change. It's always there and constant. The y component of the velocity, it changes with time. So at the beginning, it has some value. As the projectile goes up, the y component of the velocity decreases, as you can see if you compare these two. It becomes zero at the highest point, and then when it comes down to the ground, it will flip in direction. Here it is positive as the projectile is going up, but becomes negative as the projectile 
goes down. Note here that at the highest point of the projectile, the velocity is not zero like free fall, but it is equal to the x component of the velocity. Our next step, now we have done the horizontal motion and the vertical motion, is to combine these two motions to come up with the equation of the path. What is this path here? Well, it looks like a parabola. Can we prove that it is indeed parabola? We can do that if we combine these two equations here. So the next point we will consider is the path equation. And to find the path equation, what we will do is we will assume, for simplicity, that x0 is equal to y0 is equal to 0. Whatever the point of launch is, we take it to be the origin. So we just get rid of this constant here and this constant in here and there. Now, with that, we can go back to equation 5 and find what is the time. If this is 0, the time is equal to, from equation 5, the time is equal to x over v0 cosine of theta 0. Okay? From this equation, t is x over v0 cosine of theta 0. Now, substitute this value of the time in equation number, in equation number 6, okay? So, if we do so, take this to be 0, we have y is equal to v0 sine of theta 0 multiplied by t, which is this x over v0 cosine of theta 0, and then we have minus g over 2 from here times t squared, x squared over v0 squared cosine of uh, cosine squared of theta 0. Here you can see that v0 will cancel, sine over cosine is tangent, so you can write this compactly as y is equal to tangent of theta 0 multiplied by x minus g over 2 v0 cosine of theta 0 squared multiplied by x squared. This is the equation of the path that we are looking for. It relates the y coordinate of the projectile to its x coordinate. Everything else is constant. The only variables here are y and x. Theta 0 is constant, g is constant, v0 is constant, and this is our equation number 7. Now, this equation, you can compare it to the standard equation of a parabola, which says y is equal to ax plus bx squared. This is the equation of a parabola. So, indeed, we have proved that the path of the projectile in the air is that of a parabola. So it will follow a parabolic path. The last thing we have here with our mathematical analysis is to find the horizontal range. Horizontal range. And by the horizontal range, which you can see in here, this distance from launch to end is what we call the horizontal range. So it is the horizontal distance that the projectile has traveled uh, when it returns to its initial or launch height. Okay, So it is the, the horizontal distance traveled by the projectile before striking the, the ground again. We want to find this, uh, the value of this quantity. So to do that, we will again have the same assumption here, let x0 be equal to y0, b0, whatever the launch point is, we take it to be the origin, and then 
the horizontal uh, range is basically a distance, the horizontal distance, and here is the horizontal distance. Take this to be zero, and you can see that R, the horizontal range, is equal to V0 cosine of theta zero multiplied by T. But let's call it T star. What is T star? This is the flight time, the time that the projectile is in the air, the time it takes the projectile to strike the ground again. So this is, we can briefly call it the time of flight of the projectile. How do we find that? Well, we go to uh, this, we will get it number eight. How do we find this time? We go to the equation for the y coordinate and use it. This is zero, so we have y, y is equal to v0 sine of theta zero t star. No, let's just write the equation in general as it is. Minus one half g t squared. When it strikes the ground, y is zero. The corresponding time is t star. V zero sine of theta zero t star minus one half g t star squared. Solve this equation for t star, the time of flight, and you will find that it is equal to 2v0 sine of theta 0 divided by g. And this is our equation number 9. That's the time of flight we are looking for. What is left for us is to take this time of flight back into this equation. Substitute and clean up the things. You will see that we will have uh, 2 v0 sine theta 0 cosine theta 0 2 sine cosine is sine 2 theta okay and then we have g here then we have uh, what we have uh, that's it that's all we have so I will just erase this we took the time to find the time of flight so I'll take that equation there and remove this just to save the space here and what we have is the equation for the range of the projectile, and that is equal to, if you substitute T star back here, you will find that the range is equal to V0 squared. We have V0 from here and another V0 from T star. Sine of two theta zero, that's because two sine cosine so that's two uh, sine two theta zero divided by g and this is the equation of the horizontal range that we are looking for now a very important point to note here is that to use this equation the initial and the final point must be at the same vertical height so for example if i throw a projectile from the top of a building okay of course it will follow a projectile path until it strikes the ground I cannot say that this distance here is R I cannot I cannot use that equation there because the initial vertical level and the final vertical level are different so we cannot use this one they must be at the same vertical level to be able to use this equation Another thing, a question. What value of theta will make R maximum? So let's say that I can launch a projectile. Its speed is fixed. V0 is fixed. What value of theta? Suppose that I can change the launch angle. What value of theta will make R maximum? Will give me the maximum value of the range. Well, you can see from the side the maximum value of sine is 1, and that is when the angle is 90 degrees. So when 2 theta 0 is 90 degrees, we will have maximum range, or when theta 0 is equal to 45 degrees. So let us write that down. 
Ag, max, occurs when theta zero is equal to 45 degrees. The last thing we have with, uh, with our analysis is just to look at the effect of air resistance. Remember, we did all of this ignoring air resistance. What happens if we have resistance from the air? Well, as you can see from here, two things will happen. First, the maximum height is reduced. This is the ideal situation. That is what we did here without air resistance. And this is the real situation with air resistance. Of course, we didn't uh, analyze this situation. It is very complicated. You may need a supercomputer to analyze this one. But people who did it came up with this conclusion. First, the maximum height is reduced. And second, the horizontal range is also reduced because of the resistance from the air. So this is projectile motion and its mathematical analysis. What we will do now is we will look at some uh, problems, examples, and problems from the book related to projectile motion. And we will start with this example from the textbook. It's good if you remember these equations, but as we will see in the problems, you really don't have to. You have to analyze the problem, each case by case, treating it as one-dimensional problems, like we said at the beginning. So, sample problem 404 says the following. In the figure below, let's understand the situation. Here we have a drowning, this is the sea, and here we have a drowning person. So we want to send uh, a rescue capsule, okay? Where is that? A rescue capsule. We want to send it to him so he can use it to save himself from drawing. And the rescue capsule is to be thrown by an airplane that flies horizontally. Once the capsule is released from the airplane, at the release point, it has an initial horizontal velocity, which is the velocity of the airplane. But once it is in the air, gravity comes in, so it will give it the extra vertical motion, the horizontal motion of the airplane plus the extra gravitational uh, motion. So it will follow the parabolic projectile path until it strikes the sea. Now, the question here is at what point, of course, if the, uh, if the pilot of the airplane released the package while he is immediately over the person, we know that the package will not reach him because it will fall forward. So we have to release the package at some distance before we reach the person so that it will reach him. So this problem can be asked in two ways. Either at what distance before reaching the person should we release the package? Or like in this problem, suppose that we draw a line from the airplane to the drowning person. That is the line of sight. The line of sight. And let's say that that line makes an angle phi with the vertical. And let's say that somehow in the airplane that is an there is an instrument that can measure this angle phi. So at what value of phi should we release the package so that it reaches the drowning person? Okay, that's the idea here. So let's read the problem. The problem says in the figure below, a rescue plane flies at 198 kilometers per hour, that is its speed, which is 55 meters per second, at constant height of 500 meters above the sea, toward the point directly over a victim, where a rescue capsule is to land. What should be the angle phi of the pilot's line of sight to the victim when the capsule reach uh, with the capsule release is made so we want to find the angle of uh, that angle phi and the way to do it we know what is h h is uh, 500 meters the question is what is x if we can find h and x then tangent to phi is x over h and that's how we will solve the problem. 
So let us find how much is the horizontal uh, distance moved by the projectile. Well, let's see how long the time, how long is the time taken for the capsule to go from the airplane until it strikes the, uh, the person. So at impact, at impact means when the package reaches the sea. What do we have? We have, let's consider the vertical motion, y minus y0 is equal to v0 y t minus one half g t squared. When we reach the, uh, the sea, it's ground level, zero. The initial height is that of the airplane, H. Initially, the plane is flying horizontally, so there is no component, no Y component of the initial velocity. So this is zero, and we have minus, we have minus one half G T squared. Cancel this with that, and you can see that the time required by the package to reach the C is equal to 2H over G under the square root. Now let's look at the horizontal motion. The horizontal motion is motion with constant speed. So we say distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. The speed doesn't change. So it will always be equal to V0X, its initial value. How much is that? That's the speed of the airplane, 55 meters per second. So this is equal to V0, the speed of the plane, multiplied by T, which we found here. So it will be 2H over G under the square root. Okay, now, tangent to phi, tangent to phi, the phi defined as shown in here is equal to x over h. So it is x over h, which is v, uh, h is equal to v0, okay, times 2h over g under the square root multiplied by 1 over h. So take the h inside the, uh, take the h inside the uh, square root and what we have is tangent of phi is equal to V0, and then we have two over G H under the square root, okay? Now we have it all. We know what is the initial speed. The initial speed is 500, no, the initial speed is 55 meters per second. The height is 500 meters. Put them in here. Take tangent inverse and you will find that the angle phi requested for the package to reach the victim is equal to 48 degrees. The second part of the problem says, as the capsule reaches the water, what is its velocity? The velocity of the capsule with which it hits or strikes the water in unit vector notation and in magnitude angle notation. So we want to find the final velocity, the velocity of the capsule at impacts uh, the water. So we will find the x and y components of the velocity. For the x component, it's straightforward. Vx is V0x, it doesn't change, and that is equal to the initial velocity of the plane, which is equal to 55 meters per second. The y component can be found from this equation, vy squared is v0y squared minus 2gy minus y0. Well, there is no y component of the initial velocity, it's horizontal. Okay, there is no Y component. And when it reaches the C, Y final is zero, and this is the initial height of the airplane. 
So we can see that Vy squared is equal to the minus will cancel the minus 2gh, and therefore Vy is, we take the square root of both sides plus minus 2gh under the square root. But note that the final velocity has a negative y component, so we will take the negative square root in here. And therefore Vy is minus 2 times 9.8 times 500 under the square root, and that will be equal to minus 99 meters per second. So we can write the velocity in unit vector notation. It is this one, 55 i, and this one minus 99 j in meters per second. In uh, magnitude angle notation, the magnitude of the velocity, the speed with which it hits the water is 55 squared plus 99 squared under the square root, and that will be equal to 113 meters per second. The angle theta, note how theta is defined, it's not the usual way. Theta is defined as the angle below the horizontal, so this is the y component, the 99, this is the x component, 55, and therefore theta is equal to tangent inverse of 99 over 55, and that is equal to 61 degrees below the sea level. Next, we will uh, consider another problem from the textbook, which is this one. And here is the video that explains what is going on in this problem. So a typical example in projectile motion. <clears throat> the problem, as you can see in here, let me switch off the light so you can see what is going on. Personally, we have a, a person, this is a slide, a wet slide. There's the person, it comes, he comes on this plate, this plane or this stage, there it is. So here he is coming on the stage and he flies like a projectile to fall on a water pool. Okay, that's the situation we have here. So this is the same problem as we have here. The problem says, suppose that the horizontal distance moved by uh, the person while he is in the air, the horizontal distance is 200 meters. The uh, time he takes in the air until he reaches the pool is 25 seconds, and the launch angle from here is equal to 40 degrees. Given this information, the problem says find the magnitude of the velocity, find the speed at launch and at landing. So let us analyze uh, the situation. What we are given in the problem is the following. We are given that x is equal to the horizontal distance moved, and according to the equations we saw at the beginning, this is motion with constant speed, so distance is equal to speed multiplied by time, the speed is v0x multiplied by time, which is equal to v0 cosine of theta 0, that's v0x, multiplied by the time. From here you can immediately find what is v0, this is the launching speed, the initial speed of launch, and that is equal to d divided by uh, t times cosine of theta 0, the horizontal distance moved is 20 meters, the flight time in the air is 2.5 seconds, and the launch angle theta zero is 40 degrees. So we put all of that in here, and we find that the initial speed is 10.44 meters per second. That's one thing. That's the magnitude of the velocity at launch, the, initial, the magnitude of the initial velocity. Now we want to find his speed when he reaches here. It's like the previous problem. Okay, this point here, 
is like the previous problem. So we have to find the X and Y components and then combine them to find the final speed. Let's look at the X component. So this is <clears throat> at the pool, okay, at the end point when he reaches the pool. Vx doesn't change, it's equal to its initial value, and that is equal to V0 cosine of theta zero. We already found what is V0, it is 10.44 cosine of 40 degrees, and that will be equal to 8.00 meters per second. V0y, we needed to find the final uh, y component, is equal to V0 sine of theta zero, and that is equal to 10.44 sine of 40 degrees, and that is equal to 6.71 meters per second. So Vy at the pool is equal to V0y minus GT, which is equal to 6.71 minus 9.8 times the flight time, 2.5 seconds, and that will be equal to minus 17.79 meters per second. And therefore, the velocity of the person when he reaches the pool is the X component, 8.00i, and then the Y component, which is 17.79 J. That's if we want to write it in unit vector notation. If we want it as a speed, it will be 8.00 squared plus 17.79 squared under the square root, and that will be equal to 19.5 meters per second. So at launch is equal to 10.44. When he reaches the pool, his speed is almost double, 19.5. Uh, meters per second. We will next consider another example, but this one now is from the old edition of the textbook. So this is sample problem 47 from the old edition of the textbook. The problem says, in the figure below, a pilot ship is 560 meters from a fort, let's say a port, defending a harbor entrance. So here we have a cannon, and the cannon is firing balls toward objects in the sea. A defense cannon located at sea level fires balls at initial speed of 82 meters per second. So the speed of the balls going out of the cannon is fixed, 82 meters per second. What we are changing here is the launch angle, okay? So the problem says, the problem says, at what angle theta zero, at what angle theta zero, from the horizontal, must a ball be fired to hit the ship? In other words, if I want the range to be 560 uh, meters for this initial speed, what should be the launch angle? So here we use the equation of the range and proceed from it to find the value of the angle theta, the launch angle theta. And therefore, we start with the range equation. Which says R is equal to V0 squared over G multiplied by sine of 2 theta 0. We know R, we want it to be 560. The initial speed is 82, what is theta. So <clears throat> putting the numbers here, 2 theta 0 is equal to sine inverse of Rg over V0 squared. And this is equal to sine inverse of the range we want it to be 560. G is 9.8 and V0 is 82. 
2 and then we square it. So this is sine inverse of 0.816. Put this number in your calculator and remember that for any given value of theta, we have two corresponding angles. Like if we have sine of theta is one half. What angles will give me this value of theta, uh, of sine? It's either theta is 30 degrees or theta is equal to 150 degrees. Both of them will give me the same value of, of sine. How did we get this? Well, 180 minus 30, uh, 30 is equal to 150. So here we have the same situation. We have two solutions. The first solution is 2 theta 0. Remember the angle we are looking for is 2 theta, look theta. 2 theta 0 is equal to 54.7 degrees. And that's what I get from the calculator. If you go to the calculator, sine inverse 0.816, that's the answer you get. The other answer is when you subtract this from 180, like we have here. So the other answer is 2 theta 0, 180 minus this is equal to 125.3 degrees. So these are the two answers we have for 2 theta. From them, we get theta. We just divide by 2. So this will give me theta 0. This over 2 will be 27.4 degrees. And this over 2 will give me 62.7 degrees. Both are possible answers because they are both less than 90 degrees. And that's what you see in here. So for a given range, there are two angles at which we get into that range. And that's what we have here. Part B says, what is the maximum range of the cannonballs? Remember what we did in our derivations? We said that the range is maximum when theta zero is 45 degrees. Okay, so for that given speed, which is 82 meters per second, what is the maximum range that we can reach? We can reach it if theta is 45 degrees. And if you put 45 degrees, this will be 90. Sine of 90 is 1. And therefore, R max is equal to V0 squared divided by G. And that will be equal to 82 squared divided by 9.8 and that will be 686 meters. That's the maximum range that can be reached by this cannon. And these are the examples we have from uh, the book on projectile motion. What we will do next is we will look at some problems. Okay, these were all examples from the textbook. So now we will look at some problems from the textbook. And we will start here with uh, problem 28 from the textbook. Let's see what do we have here. Problem 28 says, in this figure, a stone is projected at a cliff. So here is the cliff, and we are sending a stone, we are throwing it from the ground, and we want to hit at point A on top of the cliff. So a stone is projected at a cliff of height small h with an initial speed of 42 meters per second directed at an angle theta of 60 degrees above the horizontal. The stone strikes at A 5.5 seconds after launching. So the time it takes the stone to go from the ground to point A is 5.5 seconds. And the problem says find the height h of the cliff. Find the speed of the stone just before impact at A. So again, this is like the speeds we found uh, in this point here or this point here. Okay, we will do the same thing. Find the speed with which the stone hits point A. And finally, find the maximum height, capital H, that is reached above the ground. So let's look at this situation. You can, of course, do the problems in many ways. This is just one way 
to do the problem. So here is what we have. In problem 28, what we are given are the following. We are given V0, the launch speed is 42 meters per second. Okay, and we are given the launch angle as 60 degrees, and we are given the time as 5.5 seconds. What is this time? Again, this is the time to go from here to here. So, let us first find what is the height h, small h, of the cliff. For that, we can use the equation for the y coordinate of the motion. y minus y0 is equal to v0 y t minus 1 half g t squared. If we take our reference to be the ground, then this is zero. And if we are looking at the cliff, then y is small h is equal to this one here is v0 sine of theta zero t minus one half g t squared. Let's put the numbers v0 42 sine 60 degrees multiplied by the time which is 5.5 minus g over 2 is 4.9, 5.5 squared, and that will give me the height of the cliff as 51.8 meter, uh, meters. Part B, we want to find the speed at this point, just before impact at point A. So, like the previous problems, we will find the x component and the y component, add them to find the speed. The x component is simple to find because it is constant. It's equal to its initial value, which is v0 cosine of theta zero. That is equal to 42 times cosine of 60 degrees, and that will be 21 meters per second. For the y component, we have v0y minus gt, and that is v0 sine of theta zero minus gt. This is 42, this is 60 degrees, this is 5.5 seconds, g is 9.8, put all these numbers and you will find that this is equal to minus 17.5 meters per second. Always you ask yourself, does it make sense? Yes, the y component is negative because it is going down. It already passed the highest point, so the y component must be negative as it is in here. So, the speed at point A is Vx squared plus Vy squared under the square root. You square these two, add them, take the square root, and that will be 27.3 meters per second. Finally, we come to part C in which we want to find the maximum height. So, one equation we can use is Vy squared is equal to V 0y squared minus 2g y minus y0. If we look at the maximum height, then the y component of the velocity is 0. This is equal to v0 sine of theta 0 squared minus 2g and the launch point is 0. And if we are at the maximum height, then y is equal to capital H. From which you can see that the maximum height, take them to this side, divide by 2g, is v0 squared sine squared of theta 0 divided by 2g. Again, v0 is 42, theta 0 is 60. We know what is g, put in the numbers, and you will find that the maximum height is 67.6 .6 meters. And there we have the maximum height that is reached by the projectile in this problem. We will now conclude with one more problem from the textbook, and that is problem 33. It is similar to the example in the book. It is similar to this example here, except that in this example, the plane 
is flying horizontally. Now we have a diving plane, a plane that makes an angle with the vertical. So let's see what do we have. This is problem 33 that says a plane diving with constant speed at an angle of 52 degrees with the vertical. Watch how the angle is made or is given. We are given the angle with the vertical. You have some problems where you are given this angle rather this one. So just deal with what you are given. We are given the angle it makes with the vertical. The plane releases a projectile at an altitude height of 720 meters. So let's redraw this one. This is what we are given. We are given this angle. So the angle that this line makes with the positive x <coughs> axis <coughs> is 322 degrees. Up to here, it is 270. 270 plus 52 is 322. And the height of the airplane at the moment of releasing the projectile is 720 meters. The projectile hits the ground six seconds after release. So we are given the time it takes to the projectile to go from the launch point until it hits the ground. That is equal to six seconds. What is the speed of the plane? How far does the projectile travel horizontally? That's the distance t. And again, what are the horizontal and vertical components of its velocity just before striking the ground? So let's deal with the problem. And I will take the angle theta as uh, theta 0 as 322 degrees. So I don't have to worry about inserting extra signs. The signs will come automatically from this angle. So in this case, what we want to find first is the speed of the plane itself. And to do that, we will look at the vertical coordinate of the projectile, which says y minus y0 <coughs> is equal to v0y t minus one half g t squared. Why did I pick this equation? It depends on what am I given. I am given the final height, that's the ground zero. The initial height I have it, 720, and the time of flight is six seconds. So that will immediately give me, I am given also uh, theta zero, so that will immediately give me the initial speed of the airplane. So at the point of strike, when it strikes the ground, y is zero, y zero is the initial height, let's call it h, that's 720, and this is equal to v zero sine of theta zero t minus one half g t squared. What I'm looking for is this quantity, okay? The initial speed of the projectile, which is the initial speed of the plane at the moment of release. Now you can rearrange the things here, bring this one here, and you have uh, one half g t squared minus h is equal to v zero sine of theta zero t. So v zero is equal to 0.5 g t squared, that's one half, minus h divided by this, divided by t sine of theta zero. Let me put the numbers now. v zero is equal to 0.5 g is 4.9 times t squared, t is six seconds, square it, 36 minus h 720 divided by t, which is six, multiplied by sine of 322, 322 degrees. Okay. And if we put all the numbers, 
this would be equal to uh, this would be equal to 147 meters per second. Remember that this will give me a negative number that will fix the negative here. So that's the initial speed of the airplane. Part B, how far does the projectile travel horizontally? Well, in the horizontal direction, it is very simple motion, motion with constant speed. So the distance moved, x is called d, is equal to vx multiplied by t, which is v0 cosine of theta0 multiplied by t. Put in the numbers. v0, we found it, 147 times t6 times cosine of 322. Of course, this is a positive number because this is a fourth quadrant, cosine is positive. So you will find that the distance moved is 695 meters. This is how much it will move horizontally. Part C and D, he wants us to find the velocity or what, what is he looking for? The vertical, the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity. Well, the horizontal component Vx is equal to its initial value, which is V0 cosine of theta zero, that is 147 cosine of 322, and that would be equal to 116 meters per second. For the y component, it is equal to V0y minus GT, which is V0 sine of theta zero minus GT. This is equal to 147 co uh, sine of 322 degrees minus 9.8 times 6 seconds. And that will give me, of course, a negative value, which is minus 149 meters per second. So here are the two components <coughs> of the velocity, the horizontal and the vertical component. If you like, you can take the extra step of finding the speed with which it strikes the ground. So in this way, we have covered completely projectile motion. We analyzed uh, the uh, problem mathematically, and then uh, we did three examples from the textbook in addition to two problems from the textbook that I hope illustrate all the various ideas related to projectile motion. Okay, today we continue our discussion of uh, chapter four. Uh, so far, we have discussed motion in two and three dimensions, and we have discussed projectile motion in the last lecture. Let's review what we studied with uh, regard to projectile motion. Uh, in projectile motion, a particle moves in a vertical plane with some initial velocity v0, but its acceleration is always the free fall acceleration. We have seen that the horizontal and vertical motions are independent, so we can separate them into one dimensional uh, motions. The horizontal one is motion with constant velocity. The vertical motion is basically free fall. We went through the equations describing this type of motion, and we have described the initial velocity horizontal motion, vertical motion, we derive the equation of the path and finally the equation for the range. Today we continue with uh, chapter four. This is our third and last lecture in this chapter. And here we have two lecture, uh, two topics. The first one is uniform circular motion, which is a two dimensional motion. And the second topic we have today is relative motion. Let's start first with this basic idea that we have seen back in chapter two. We have said that velocity is a vector. A vector has 
magnitude and direction. If any one of these two changes, we will have acceleration. So today we will see one type of motion in which although the magnitude of the velocity is constant, the speed is constant, we still have acceleration because the direction of the velocity, it changes. And that's basically what we have in uniform circular motion. A particle is in uniform circular motion if it travels around a circle, or a circular arc means part of a circle, with uniform, with constant speed. Although the speed does not change, the particle has acceleration because the direction of the velocity changes as it goes around the circle. The figure here shows the relationship between the velocity and acceleration vectors at various stages during uniform circular motion. So here are various points uh, on the circle. Uh, the velocity as we studied is always tangent to the path in the direction of motion and the acceleration is always pointing toward the center of the circle. So both vectors have constant magnitude. The magnitude of V or A do not change, but their directions change continuously. The velocity is always directed tangent to the circle in the direction of motion. The acceleration is directed radially inward. Let's understand what do we mean by this. Radially means it is along a radius of the circle. Inward means into the center. If it is pointing away from the center, we say it is radially outward. So the acceleration is directed radially inward toward the center of the circle, and therefore it is called centripetal acceleration. Center, from the word center, petal means seeking. It is always seeking, looking for the center of the circle. So this is what we call uniform circular motion. Let's now uh, write the equations relevant to this type of motion, and then we will look at some examples. So the first topic we have today is uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion. And this is the description of the motion. It's motion in which a particle moves around the circle with constant speed. There is acceleration because of the changing direction of the velocity. And the magnitude of the acceleration is equal to V squared divided by R. The magnitude of the acceleration for this type of motion is equal to v squared over r, where v is the speed of the particle and r is the radius of the circle around which the particle moves. Now, this is the type of motion in which the particle repeats itself and one quantity that uh, is very crucial for its description is called the period of the motion and the period is the time to go around the circle once the time to complete one circle the time to complete one cycle we call it the period mathematically t that's the symbol for the period is equal to. Remember that uh, we have a very simple relationship. Distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. So time is equal to distance divided by the speed. Let's use that here. What is the distance corresponding to one circle? It's the circumference of the circuit, which is 2 pi r, and the speed is just p. So this is how we calculate the period of the motion in uniform circular motion. Of course, I have stated the equation for the uh, acceleration without a proof. The proof is given in detail in the textbook, so if you are interested, you can definitely enjoy reading the, uh, the derivation for the acceleration. Now let's take an example on uniform circular motion and this is sample problem sample problem 
for 06 in the textbook and I have added this figure so you see what is going on. The problem says what is the magnitude of the acceleration in G units? How many G's are there in this acceleration of a pilot whose aircraft enters a horizontal circular turn with a velocity of VI 400 I plus 500 J meters per second and 24 seconds later leaves the turn with a velocity of minus 400i minus 500j meters per second. So we are given this information and we are requested to find the acceleration. Let us see what is going on here. The situation is like this. We are talking about a horizontal <coughs> circle and we have said that a horizontal plane is a plane that is parallel to the ground. So we have this plane okay flying in this horizontal plane we have airplane and plane uh, so the plane is is coming this way okay let's say that uh, we have a helicopter here that is videotaping the airplane and that's what it sees this is a top view let's say that the airport the airport is somewhere in here and the pilot wants to make a turn to come back to the airport so at one instant of time, when he started to make the turn, the uh, airplane is going this way. That's VI. So it has positive X and positive Y components. How much are these? These are given by this equation here. This is the initial velocity. Okay. He makes the turn back. And his velocity... At the end of the turn, when he starts to go linear again on a linear straight line, his velocity as he exits the turn is given by minus 400i minus 500j. Now let us analyze these numbers. First of all, note that there are no changes in the numbers. Remember that the speed is 400 squared plus 500 squared under the square root, be it here or there. So the speed is constant. That's what we said for uniform circular motion. But now let's look at the direction. Here is the initial velocity. Okay, that's this vector. It has positive x and positive y components. The velocity at the end of the turn is given by this. Okay, it's, it points in the third quadrant. So negative x and negative y components. And if you compare the two velocities, you will find that this is exactly the opposite of that. It's like you took that, multiplied by minus one, and that's what you get. So here are the two velocities. At the beginning of the tail and at the end of the tail. They are completely opposite to each other. Now, geometrically, that means these two points, the entry and the exit, are at the ends of a diameter of the circle. If they are not at the end of uh, at the ends of a diameter, let's say that it is in here, then the two velocities will not be opposite to each other. If they are opposite to each other, like we have here, then this means that these two points are at the ends of the diameter of the circle. That means this term here corresponds to half a circle. That means that this time here, the time to make the turn, is equal to half a period. Full circle, one period. Half a circle will be half a period. So half of the period is 24 seconds. How much is the period? 48 seconds. Okay, so now we know what is the period. We know what is the speed. What we want to find is the acceleration. So let's proceed with that. <coughs> Let us first find how much is the speed of the airplane and the speed of the airplane you can either, either use the beginning or the end the speed will be the same V is equal to 400 square plus <coughs> 500 square under the square root and that will be equal to 640 meters per second. That's the speed of the airplane. 
Now let's bring in the different equations we have. The period T is equal to 2 pi r over D. Do I know the period? Yes. Do I know the speed? Yes, but I don't know the radius. So from here you can see that the radius is equal to T V divided by 2 pi. Now let us calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. The magnitude of the acceleration is V squared over R. So you take the reciprocal of this, okay? 2 pi over T V, that's 1 over R and then multiply it by v squared. So the acceleration is 2 pi v divided by the period. How much is that? That is equal to 2 pi multiplied by the speed, 640. And then the period, we said that 24 seconds is half a period. The full period is 48 seconds. And therefore, the acceleration is 80 3.8 meters per second squared. How many g's are there? You divide this by 9.8, which is 1 g, and that will be equal to 8.5 g's. This is not a gram, this is g, the acceleration due to gravity. So there we have it. Now, let me add to this one. Let me ask, what is the average acceleration during the turn, okay? As the airplane makes the turn, how much is the average acceleration? Well, the average acceleration, as we defined it, is equal to delta V by delta T, which is equal to V final minus V initial divided by delta T. Let's subtract, okay? Let's make this subtraction. Minus 400i minus 400i is minus 800i. And then minus 500 minus 500 will be minus 1000j. And the time to make this a change from i to f is 24 seconds. So the average acceleration is equal to minus 33.3 i minus 41.7 j in meters per second squared. How much is the magnitude of this? Well, it is 33.3 squared plus 41.7 squared under the square root, and that will be equal to 53 Point four meters per second squared. Note that it is totally different from the centripetal acceleration. So every quantity here has its own definition and we have to look at it very carefully how it is defined. Let us next take a problem from the textbook on uniform circular motion. And the problem we will consider is this one, problem 65 from the textbook. It says, let me add this, I, I added all of this so you can see what is going on. The problem says, a purse, this is a purse, a wallet, a merry-go-round, okay? So as we read the problem, these are the pictures, purse, wallet. A purse at a radius of two meters and a wallet at radius of three meters travel in uniform circular motion on the floor of a merry-go-round as the right turns. They are on the same radial line, okay? okay? Very important point because it's not that one is here and the other one is there. They are on the same radial line as the platform turns. So they are on the same radial line. At one instant, the acceleration of the purse, which is the one closer to the center, that's this one, two meters, the acceleration of the purse is 2i plus 4j. So the acceleration is, has positive x, positive y components, that's the only place for it to be, 
Remember that it is always directed toward the center. And it has positive X and Y components, so that's the only place for it to be. If it were in here, then the acceleration will be that way, but in that case, it will have positive Y, negative X. Here, it will have both of them negative. Here, it will have positive X, negative Y. The only place for it to have positive components is if it is in this quadrant. So at that instant of time, this is the acceleration of the purse. At that instant, and in unit vector notation, what is the acceleration of the other particle, the wallet? So uh, let's work this out. We will start first with the purse, okay, with what we are given in the problem. And I will call this angle here theta, okay? So let's first consider the purse. and get everything we need from it. For the pairs, the acceleration, A1, one means the pairs, is equal to, how much is the magnitude of the acceleration? There it is, there's the acceleration, find the magnitude. This is squared plus this is squared, so it will be four plus 16 under the root, and that is equal to 4.47, meters per second squared. A1, this is uniform circular motion, so it will be V1 squared over R1. V1 is the speed of the pairs, and R1 is its radius, which is two meters here, okay? So V1 from here is equal to A1 R1 under the square root. Theta, the angle of the acceleration, is equal to tangent inverse, the y component, which is 4, over the x component, which is 2, and that is 63.43.43 degrees. T, the period, is equal to 2 pi r1 over v1, which is equal to 2 pi r1 and v1 is there where is v1 a1 r1 so this is equal to 2 pi get r1 under the root and it will be r1 divided by a1 now put the numbers this is equal to 2 pi into r1 the distance of the pairs is 2 meters 2 meters divided by a1 that is 4.47 under the square root, and that will be equal to 4.2 seconds. We found everything we can find for the pairs. Now, that is this one. Now let's move to the wallet. We want to find the acceleration of this one. And we ask, what is the same for both of them? Remember that they are on the same radial line. If they are on the same line, then the angle theta will be the same for both of them. You can draw theta here, it will be the same. And what else? They have the same period because they rotate together. So they will take the same amount of time to make one circle. And therefore these two quantities, the angle and the period, will be the same for both of them. With that in mind, let's now consider the wallet. The other part, the wallet. For this one, for the wallet, the period is the same, 4.2 seconds, and the angle theta is the same, 63.43 degrees. So, <clears throat> starting with the period, using the same equation, T is 2 pi R2 <coughs> over A2, like this one, from which you can find what is the acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration of the wallet, A2. A2 is equal to 4 pi squared, square both sides, 4 pi squared, R2 divided by uh, T squared. Do I have R2? Yes, R2 is 3 meters. The period is there 4.2. 
So if you put the numbers, this would be A2 is equal to 6.7 meters per second squared. So writing it as a vector, A2 is equal to the magnitude 6.7 times cosine of the angle 63.43 I plus this is just to take a, a vector, you know its magnitude and angle, resolve it into XY components, plus 6.7 times sine of uh, 63.43 degrees J. And if we put the numbers, this will be equal to 3I plus 6J in meters per second square. It is interesting. Look at the numbers. The y component is double the x. The y component is double the x. And that's because the angle is the same for both of them. Okay, so I also note, uh, I just noted that uh, this is double the radius. And this is double the radius that. So does that suggest an easier way to find the acceleration? Could be, just think about it. And that's about our first topic for today, which is uniform circular motion. Now let us move to the second topic we have today, which is relative motion. <clears throat> so let's see the idea here, and then we will discuss it and do some problems with it. And we start, like the book does, with an example to introduce the concept of relative motion. <clears throat> the example given in the book says, suppose you see a duck flying north at a speed of 30 kilometers per hour. So you are on the ground and you see this duck flying with a speed of 30 kilometers per hour. To another duck flying alongside, so here are the ducks, okay? You are watching them from the ground. You find that every one of them is flying with a speed of 30 kilometers per hour. But what about the ducks themselves? Here is one duck, okay? And here is the other one that's alongside, okay, parallel to it. What is the speed of each duck as seen by the other one. If they move together, they see themselves stationary, not moving at all, because they are moving with the same speed in the same direction. So to another duck flying alongside, the first duck seems to be stationary. It seems to be not moving at all, while we on the ground measure the speed of each duck to be 30 kilometers per hour. In other words, the velocity of a particle depends on the reference frame of whoever is observing or measuring the velocity. If you change the observer, if you change the reference frame, the velocity may change. For our purposes, a reference frame is the physical object to which we attach our coordinate system. So what we want to do now is, suppose we have two observers watching, monitoring, measuring the velocity of a particle. How do we relate their velocities? Their velocities may be different, so how do we relate their velocities? That's what we want to do. We will first start with the simple situation of one-dimensional motion, where all the objects move on a straight line, and then we will consider the more general case where the objects move in three dimensions. So, let's start with one-dimensional case. For that, we consider the figure shown here. What do we have? An observer is in a stationary frame A, which is the fixed camera. So here we have a camera that is fixed on the street. It is not moving. So this is the stationary observer. This is the stationary frame of reference. Another observer, let's call it B, is in a police car that drives with constant velocity relative to A. So here we have the stationary camera, and here we have the police car. It is driving with constant velocity 
relative to the fixed observer. Now, they both, the police car and the stationary camera, they both observe the motion of another car, let's say the taxi car that is moving on the highway. So here is our particle whose velocity is to be measured. And these are the two frames, the two observers measuring its velocity. Each one of these two may give me a different value of the velocity. So what we want to do is to relate the velocities as measured by the two observers, the fixed observer and the moving observer. The strategy that we will do is we will first relate the positions of the particle relative to the two frames. And if we have the positions, we can take the time derivative to find the velocities. And remember again that this is one dimensional motion. So everything is taking place along the same road. The car could go that way or that way, but it is along the same straight line, the same road. It's one dimensional motion. So let us work now on relating the velocities as measured by the two observers. <clears throat> so this is relative motion relative motion in one dimension where all the objects move along a straight line we will first relate the positions and what positions do we have? We have three positions. The position of the particle, in this case the taxi cab, the position of the particle relative to the fixed observer. And we will call that XPA. A is the fixed observer, P is the particle, which is uh, the taxi uh, car. The second position that we need to consider is XBA which is the position of the police car, the police car is moving, okay, relative to the fixed observer. B is for the police car. And the third position is the position of the particle, the position of the taxi, relative to the police car itself, which is XPB, the position of the particle relative to the moving frame, which is frame B. So these are the three positions. And you can see that they can be related very easily. XPA is equal to this plus this. Okay, this is how we relate the positions. So with that, we can write XPA is equal to XPB plus XBA. Taxi relative to the fixed camera, taxi relative to the police, police relative to the fixed camera. Now you have the positions, take the time derivative of this equation, differentiate it with respect to time. So we have d by dt of xpa is equal to d by dt of x. Pb plus d by dt xba. The derivative of x with respect to time is the velocity. So this one here is vpa is equal to vpb plus vba. And this is the equation we are looking for. The velocity of the taxi relative to the fixed camera is equal to the velocity of the taxi relative to the police plus the velocity of the police car itself relative to the fixed camera. The most important thing to remember here is that this is an algebraic, algebraic equation, which means that these quantities here can be positive or negative. If the police car is coming this way, its velocity is negative. If it is going that way, its, its velocity is positive. So you have to watch that when you uh, substitute the numbers. 
Now, can we relate the accelerations? Yes. Let's call this equation star. To find the acceleration, all what you have to do is take the time derivative, the time derivative of star to get the acceleration. What do we have? dv by dt is a. So a p a is equal to a p b plus a b a. And this is how the accelerations are related. But now, let us watch something very important that we stressed at the beginning. We said that the police car is moving with constant velocity relative to A. If it is moving with constant velocity, its acceleration relative to the fixed camera is zero. That is this quantity here. This will be zero if the police car is moving with constant uh, velocity. So what we have is only this, which means what? It means that the accelerations as measured by the two observers are equal. A very important conclusion, and that is if two observers are moving with constant velocity relative to each other, they measure the same acceleration for a given particle. And that's the situation in one dimension. Now let's move to three dimensions, okay, to relative motion in three dimensions. In three dimensions, the situation will look like this, okay? So you can think of it as an example this way. Now instead of a car moving on the highway, let's think of boats in the sea. So again, we have a fixed observer, which is someone holding a camera on the shore. And here we have a moving frame, which is a police boat that is moving in the sea. And they both, the one fixed on the shore, and the police boat, they both measure the velocity of this boat. But now it is moving on the water, so this is two-dimensional motion. But we will fix the axis so that for the moving frame, the, the frame of the police boat, the axes are parallel to the original axis. That means we don't have rotation. If we have rotation, it becomes a very complicated situation. So we will only deal with the case where the axes are parallel. Now, like we did in here, we will first relate the positions and then take the time derivative. In this case, here is how we turn the uh, positions. R P A is the position vector of the boat whose velocity is to be determined, the position vector of the boat relative to the fixed observer. RPB is the position vector of the boat relative to the police. And then we have RBA, which is the position vector of the police boat itself relative to the ground. What is the relation between these three vectors? Apply the head tail method of chapter three. We have two vectors, one and two, and this is the resultant. So this is the head tail method. Vector one, from its head, we draw vector two, and this is the resultant of the two. So the positions in this case are related, as we can see in this figure. <coughs> the positions are related by RPA, RPA, which is the velocity of the particle relative to the fixed frame, is equal to RPB, sorry, the position of the particle relative to the fixed frame is equal to the position of the particle relative to the moving frame plus the position of the moving frame itself relative to the fixed frame. So the velocity, take the time derivative of this, VPA is equal to VPB plus VBA which is the velocity relative to the fixed frame <coughs> is equal to the velocity relative to the moving frame plus the velocity of the moving frame itself. We will now consider some examples 
we will have uh, one example on one dimensional motion and we will have an example on two dimensional motion and the problem on two dimensional motion. Let's start first with the simple example of one dimensional motion. And this is sample problem 407 in the textbook. This is one dimensional motion now. It says, suppose that B, what is B? The police car, okay? B is the moving frame, the police car. Suppose that B is moving at a constant velocity, VBA, that's what we have here, of 52 kilometers per hour. And car P, the taxi, for example, is moving in the negative fixed direction. So here is the fixed camera. The police car is going that way, and the taxi is coming toward us in the negative fixed direction. If A, the fixed camera, measures a constant velocity of the car of minus 78 kilometers per hour for car P, what velocity will observer B, will the police car, measure? So let's see the situation. The police car is going that way with a speed of 52. The car is coming toward us with a speed of 78 kilometers per hour. What speed will be measured by the police car? Now think of it. Will the police car measure more or less speed? Forget about the direction. The direction is negative. What about the speed? Well, I think you can easily see that the speed as measured by the police car will be higher because the car is coming this way and the police car is approaching it. So they feel faster for each other. What is the speed of the car as measured by the police car? It is the speed of the police car, 52, plus the speed of the car itself, which is 78. So that will be 50 plus 80, 130 kilometers per hour is the speed of the car as measured by the police car. Now let us get that from the equation we have. The equation is there. Do we have VPA? Yes, we have the velocity of the car relative to the fixed frame. Do we have VBA, the, the velocity of the police car itself? Yes, that's uh, 50, uh, 52. What we want is this one, the velocity of the car relative to the police car. So if we do that here, This is the quantity we want, VPB, the velocity of the particle relative to the moving frame. That is equal to VPA, VPA, the velocity relative to the fixed frame, minus VBA, the velocity of the moving frame itself. Let's put the numbers. The velocity of the car relative to the fixed frame, there it is, minus 78. The velocity of the moving frame itself, 52, minus 52. So this is minus 130 kilometers per hour, as we expected. And it is where with the negative sign, which is the correct direction for the velocity. So this is a problem in one dimensional motion. Now let's move to the other example, which is about two dimensional motion. And this is sample problem 408. Let's First, understand the idea here. What we have here is an airplane that wants to fly from city A to city B, which is right to the east of it. If we don't have wind and the pilot of the airplane directs the airplane toward the east, then it will start here and end up at this point here. But let's say that we have wind that is blowing toward the north. What will happen? The wind will uh, push the airplane, deviate it from its uh, line, and the airplane may end up at this point. So if we have this wind blowing this way, and I want the airplane to go from here to here, what should we do? We should direct the airplane at some angle below the horizontal, so that the wind will come and push it, so that at the end, if we add this to this, we end up with the final point that we would like to, to have. 
So that's the idea in this problem. Let's read it. The problem says, in figure A, okay, which is this one, a plane moves due east. Okay, what we see on the ground is we see a plane starting at this point and ending at that point. Okay, so we see it moving toward the east. That's what we see. How is that done? That's the job of the pilot. But what we see on the ground is we have a particle that goes in the east direction. So a plane moves due east while the pilot points the plane somewhat south of east. This is east, this is south. So he directs the airplane somewhat south of east toward the steady wind. The wind is blowing this way now. The wind is blowing this way. So it will push the airplane so that at the end we have what we desire, which is a plane moving in the east direction. A plane moves due east while the pilot points the plane somewhat south of east toward the steady wind that blows to the northeast. That's the wind. The plane has velocity VPW relative to the wind. That is uh, the, the speed meter in the airplane reads VPW, reads the speed of the plane relative to the wind with an airspeed, which is the speed relative to the wind of 215 kilometers per hour. That's what he reads while being in the airplane. That is his speed relative to the wind. What we observe on the ground will be different. Directed at angle theta south of east. The wind itself has velocity VWG, the velocity of the wind relative to the ground with a speed of 65 kilometers per hour directed 20 degrees east of north. So here is the north and the wind is 20 degrees east of north like we see it in here. What is the magnitude of the velocity VPG, the velocity of the plane relative to the ground, and what is the angle theta at which the airplane should be directed? So, let's see what we have here. First of all, let us label the things that we have. And here are the labels. G stands for the ground, which is the fixed frame. W stands for the wind, which is the moving frame. And P stands for the plane, which is the particle, like the taxi in the one-dimensional case. Now let's just write the equation. If we write the equation correctly for the velocities, there is the substitution. The equation says, the velocity of the particle, what is the particle, the plane, relative to the fixed frame, the ground, you have to use vectors now, this is two-dimensional motion, is equal to the velocity of the particle relative to the moving frame, which is the wind, plus the velocity of the moving frame, which is the wind, relative to the fixed frame, which is the ground. This is the correct equation relating the velocities. Now, we want to write the equation for each one of these in unit vector notation, and then substitute them back and get the two unknowns, VPG and theta. So, this is our equation number one. Let's start with VPG, the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. We don't know how much is it, we want to find, but we, want, we know that it is in the east direction. So it is a vector, if we call east x, okay, and north y, then this is a vector in the x direction, and therefore it's equal to its magnitude, vpg, with the unit vector i. Okay? So that is the, uh, the first vector here. The second vector, vpw, which is the velocity of the plane relative to the wind. How much is that? Well, here it is. It's a vector whose magnitude is 215 kilometers per hour, making an angle theta. So that will be equal to 215, that's the magnitude, cosine theta i, that's the x component of this, which is in the positive x direction. The y component will be in the negative y direction. So we add 
a negative sign here and it will be 2 fifine of theta j okay okay that's the y component the third quantity which is vwg vwg the speed of the wind the velocity of the wind relative to the ground again it is this vector its magnitude is 65 kilometers per hour making an angle of 20 degrees with the y-axis so 70 degrees with the x-axis let's put that here it will be 65 cosine 70 we take the angle with the x-axis i plus 65 sine of 70 j and if we put the numbers this will be equal to 22.23 i plus 61.08 j in kilometers per hour and this is our equation number four so now we do the substitution where is the substitution the substitution will be as follows we will take equations two three and four back to one so two three four back into equation number one what do we have I think I can remove this. This is the previous example, so we can remove it and leave only the thing pertinent to this example problem for 08. So, VPG, where is VPG? There it is, VPG I is equal to VPW, there it is, 215 cosine theta i minus 215 sine theta j and then plus vwg which is this plus 22.23 i plus 61.08 j and now what you have to do is equate the i's on this side with the i's on that side equate the j's on this side with the j's on that side let's start with the i's what do i have here v p g is equal to what i's do i have 2 15 cosine of theta and then i have this plus 22.23 and that's it how many unknowns do I have here? I don't know VPG and I don't know theta. So I cannot do anything with this equation. Just let me call it equation number five. Next, let me equate the J's. On this side, we don't have any J, zero. What J's do I have here? I have minus 215 sine of theta. And then I have this J plus 61.08. Now, I can immediately find what the sine of theta. Sine of theta is equal to 61.08 divided by 215. So, divide these and then take sine inverse, and you will find theta to be 16.5 degrees. I found one of the unknowns. Now, let me go back to 5. Back to Five. Substitute theta there now. I know what is theta. So VPG, the speed of the plane relative to the ground, is 215 cosine of 16.5 degrees plus 22.23. And that will give me a value of 228.4 kilometers per hour. That's the speed of the plane relative to the ground its speed relative to the wind is 215 for us on the ground we see it as 228.4 kilometers per hour
and here we have a two-dimensional relative motion problem. We will conclude with a problem now, not an example, a problem from the book on two-dimensional motion. And the problem we will consider is this one, problem 80 from the textbook. So I will uh, remove this one so we have the space uh, to look at this problem here. <clears throat> okay, the problem says a 200 wide, a 200 meter wide river flows due east at a uniform speed of 2.5 meters per second. Okay, let me put the picture. Okay, this is an additional picture to, to see what is going on. So we have a river, let's say like this, okay. It is, the water in the river is flowing in the east direction with a speed of 2.5 meters per second. That's the speed of the river relative to the ground. A boat with a speed of 8 meters per second relative to the water leaves the south bank, okay. So let's say again that this is the uh, this is the, the river. We have a boat that leaves the south bank, headed toward the north bank. But it leaves the south bank in a direction that makes an angle of 30 degrees west of north. So the boat doesn't go straight to the north but rather it is directed this way. How much? 30 degrees west of north. So here is the north, and we go 30 degrees west of the north, that way, as you can see in here. So this is the velocity of the boat relative to the river, that's what is given here. The problem says, what are the magnitude and direction of the boat's velocity relative to the ground? So in this problem, we know the velocity of the river relative to the ground. There it is. We know the velocity of the boat relative to the river. There it is given. And what we want to find is the velocity of the boat relative to the ground. So let's label the quantities, write the equation, and then we will substitute. This is problem 80 from the textbook. The labels that we will use are G for the ground, that's the fixed frame, R for the river, that's the moving frame, and B for the boat. There is our particle. So let's form the equation. The equation says the velocity of the particle. What is the particle? The boat relative to the fixed frame, the ground, is equal to the velocity of the particle, the boat, relative to the moving frame, the river, plus the velocity of the moving frame, river, relative to the ground. Okay, there we have the equation. Now, like we did with the airplane example, let's write each one of these. Remember that it is this quantity, here that we want to find. Okay, we want to find the velocity of the boat, the velocity of the boat relative to the ground, find magnitude and direction. So, let us find these two. VVR, VBR. What is that? The velocity of the boat relative to the river. Well, it is this vector here, whose magnitude is 8 meters per second, making an angle of 30 degrees west of the north, okay? 30 degrees, 30 degrees west of the north. So how much is that from the x-axis? It's 90 plus 30, which is 120 degrees. And therefore, this is equal to the magnitude 8, 
multiplied by cosine 120 degrees i plus 8 times sine 120 degrees j. If we put the numbers, this will be equal to minus 4i minus 4i plus 6.93j meters per second. That is this one. Next, we look at this one. The velocity of the river relative to the ground. It is very simple. The river has a speed 2.5 in the east direction. So this is 2.5i meters per second. Now, back to one. What you have to do is add these two vectors. So VPG is equal to add the i's. Minus 4 plus 2.5 minus 1.5 i. Add the j's. 6.93, 0. So plus 6.93 j in meters per second. That's the velocity of the boat relative to the ground. Now, if you want the magnitude and the direction, you can see that VBG, the speed of the boat relative to the ground, is 1.5 squared plus 6.93 squared under the square root, and that is equal to 7.1 meters per second. What angle does it make? Again, make a sketch. We have a vector, negative x, positive y, so this is a vector in the second quadrant. It is somewhere in there. Find this angle, let's call it phi. Phi is equal to tangent inverse of 6.93 divided by 1.5, and that will be equal to 77.8 degrees. And therefore, theta, which is the angle from the positive x direction, is 102.2 degrees. Now, you can express this in many ways, okay? It depends on the language of the problem. You can say that this is, uh, where is that? That's fine, okay? You can say that this is 77.8 north of west, or how much is left in here? 90 minus this is 12.2, right? 12.2. So you can say it is 12.2 degrees west of north. Okay, you can use any one of these languages. There is the speed and that's the direction. The last part of the problem, how long does the boat take to cross the river? Okay, it is going this way. It will reach at a point here. How long does it take to cover this trip? Well, remember that it is a simple uh, problem. Uh, time is equal to distance over speed. The speed is there. Okay, that's the speed we measure. We have the stopwatch, so we have to use the speed that we measure. Only thing you have to do is to find how much is this distance. Okay, that's one way. Or you focus your attention on the width of the river. The width of the river is 200 meters. That's the y direction. But to use it, you have to use the y component of the velocity, which is the 6.93. So keep that in mind. The time to cross the river is equal to the width of the river, let me call it d, divided by the speed of the boat, uh, the speed of the boat, the velocity of the boat, relative to the ground, but we use its y component. So this is 200 meters, and the y component is this one, 6.93, so this will take 28.9 seconds, which is roughly uh, 29 seconds, which is roughly half a minute. That's the time it takes the boat to cross the river. In that way, we covered uh, the relative motion concept, both in one and two dimensions, and that brings us to the end of chapter four.